Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you're all very welcome and thanks for joining in tonight. Um, tonight's webinar is going to focus in on the breeding plan um, and is part of the wider ICBF Chagas Breeding Week initiative, which is, which is ongoing throughout, throughout this week. Um, my name's James Dunn and I'm going to host tonight. I have three excellent speakers, George Ramsbottom, dairy specialist, Stephen Moore, um, Chagas researcher in Moore Park, um, focusing on herd fertility. And we have William Dennehy joining in, dairy farmer joining in from Farn Foran County Kerry. So look at, as always, um, this is an interactive session. So please do use the chat box um, along the bottom of your screens, submit your questions, and we will endeavor to, to ask them throughout. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to George and Stephen, who are going to give a 15 to 20 minute presentation on, in terms of the herd fertility targets we set out. Um, the importance of these and also some of the management practices, I suppose, that will ensure a successful breeding season um, over the coming months. So, George, without further ado, um, we'll let you start presenting and we'll, we'll, we'll take questions um, after your presentation. Thanks very much, um, James. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk here tonight. Um, your, our audience is uh, happy in the knowledge that I've spared the sight of me tonight. My camera seems to have acted up, which we'll, we'll, work on, we'll work on regardless. I want to bring you back to a kind of a reminder of why uh, fertility and you know, compact early calving is so critical in, on the, in dairy systems. And I suppose this slide, uh, to me, summarizes really what's happening, uh, what needs to happen on dairy farms to synchronize grass growth and uh, milk production. The green line shows our typical uh, grass growth profile peaking there in April, between April and July. And the red line uh, that kind of mirrors it is our daily herd feed requirement. So we're trying to uh, maximize as much as we can the proportion of the diet that the cow receives that's coming from grazed graph, grass. And that can only be done uh, by compact uh, calving and compact breeding periods. In an ideal world, um, we calve our cows over a 12-week period, with the majority calved in, in February and early March. And to achieve uh, such a calving profile, compact uh, calving requires compact breeding, occurring in late April through May, with the tail end of it happening in, in June into early July. If we look then at what the, kind of the breeding targets that we'd set for it, our dairy herds, uh, we'd, have a, we'd set targets uh, of the cows, for example, of 90% submitted in three weeks, within three weeks of the start of the breeding season, and 60% uh, or bigger part, 90% calving um, in, in six weeks uh, in the calving season. We'd also target a 365-day calving interval to minimize slippage that might be occurring. And we talk at the end of a breeding season of 12 weeks in duration, of having a planned empty rate of less than 8%. Perhaps our, our overall replacement rate might be averaging around 18%, but less than half of those animals in an ideal world are ones we intentionally didn't put in calf. The national, um, the national averages are, fall somewhat short of these targets. So for example, if we look at a heifer three week submission rate, it averages only 78%, so things are improving, but it's still only 78%. Really, we, we're targeting 100% of heifers submitted in the first three weeks of the breeding season. To be honest, if I was uh, focused on it, I'd be targeting maybe 100% uh, submitted in the first two weeks of the breeding season to ensure that they calve early and have two chances, two opportunities of inputting calf within five weeks of the start of the uh, breeding season. The cow submission rate is far from um, 90% is actually at 71% in a six in the first three weeks of the breeding season. So again, it's falling far far short of the ideal. And our herd six-week calving rate, rather than averaging 90%, it's actually 
currently averaging only 65%. So the three targets were a bit off where we'd like them to be with considerable scope for improvement. And much of the focus of the rest of our conversation here tonight is going to be based around trying to improve those three figures. I often talk about um, maybe a, high, a fertility stool. A stool has four legs under it. Four legs hold the seat in place and keep it upright. And from a fertility perspective, the four legs that underpin uh, high fertility on dairy farms are adequate nutrition right through the breeding season and beyond. Uh, a high standard of, of disease control, a plant prepared in consultation with your vet, stuck to it and stick to it. Uh, genetics for fertility to be covered in other, in other webinars other than this one tonight. And the fourth point, and it's one we want to deal with a lot tonight, is the whole issue of mating management. But as the years have gone on, I've refined our fertility stool. And instead of talking about a fertility stool, I, I tend now to talk about a fertility chair. It still has the four legs under it of nutrition, disease control, mating management, and genetics. But the fifth element to our fertility chair is management, genetics, and the issues centering around the replacement heifers coming into the dairy herd. And James, if, if time permits, it's an area we'd like to get back to at the end of our conversation with you tonight um, as we move through some of the issues around achieving a high level of, of fertility on, on dairy farms. Absolutely. Okay. Now, the next um, thing then, James, is I'm going to hand over to Stephen Moore um, from Moore Park. And Stephen is going to summarize some of the actions around maximizing a three-week in calf ration, some of the synchronization methodologies he's found successful at getting cows and calf. Stephen, do you want to take over here now? Do you want to take control of the... Of yeah, the so... I stop sharing. Yeah, you do that, George, yeah. Just while we're waiting, George, you, you showed the national figures there. Um, and as you said, the, there is improvements throughout. I suppose if, right. if you were to target some of those things, I think you did mention about targeting um, the heifers. I suppose, why is that? I'll elaborate on that a little bit. Why I'd focus on the heifers um, is because the heifers are the animals that maintain, uh, that prevent slippage in your dairy herd. So achieving early compact calving not just sets up the fertility metrics for the dairy herd, but it also sets the heifers themselves up for a long and productive life in the dairy herd. If they're not bred and in calf early in their first year, they're on the back foot for the rest of their lifetime in the herd. And nationally, we know that maybe as much as one in seven or one in eight heifers leaves the herd at the end of her first lactation. Heifers are already expensive enough to get into the herd without losing them after their first lactation. So early compact breeding and calving of our maiden heifers is absolutely critical to their lifetime productivity within the dairy herd. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Stephen. Yeah, sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you, James and George. Um, so in terms of our, like uh, maximizing the three week in calf rates, the two main factors that are going to be driving that are the, the three-week submission rate and the conception rate. And, you know, cows that are non-cycling um, or farms with a poor heat detection, they are the main issues that are going to drag down uh, the submission rate. The other issue uh, with cows are cows that have a uterine disease. And we know that cows that have a uterine disease like endometritis or metritis they have uh, lower conception rates. So the two main kind of factors that are, that are in our control to maximize the in-calf rate are the submission rate and conception rate. In terms of, I guess, identifying these animals that are not cycling or her, that have uh, uterine health issues, this work needs to be kind of beginning to start over the next couple of weeks, about three to five weeks before mating starts it. And I guess the first group of uh, cows that can be targeted and identified very easily are the thin cows. <clears throat> so the cows with a body condition score of two and a half um, or less. So pretty now would be a very good time to body condition score uh, the entire herd, identify uh, these thin cows. And the best option for these is going to put them on once a day milking from now until at least three weeks um, after their first insemination. 
Um, and the idea behind this is to um, increase their body condition score. And this really is going to take a few weeks to, you know, to have an impact. So it should, it, they should be put on, on once a day milking now, so that by come mating start date, they are going to be at least two and a half and ideally three body condition score. The next step then over the next few weeks is going to be to identify uh, the cows in the herd that are not cycling, okay? And this can be done either through a pre-breeding heat detection um, or get, getting uh, the vet or the scanner in to do a pre-breeding ultrasound. And this needs to be done over the next couple of weeks to identify these non-cyclers. Um, so I, there's gonna be probably, you're gonna end up with more than likely two groups of cows that need to be synchronized. The first group of cows are the cows that are not cycling and that are at least 30 days at milk. Um, and they, they should be uh, put on the synchronization protocol about 10 days before mating start date so that they can be synchronized and they will get their first insemination on mating start date. However, there will be, as I mentioned, some of these later calving cows that just won't be calved long enough to fit in with the first group of cows that are, that are the first group of non-cyclers to be synchronized. So the next uh, step then will be to any of the cows that have not been submitted, uh, you know, during the, the first couple of weeks that are those late calvers that haven't started cycling yet, synchronize them again so that they can be submitted by on day 21 uh, of the breeding season. So three weeks into the breeding season. So, you know, this would be a very good um, aid to ensuring then that these non-cycling cows do get submitted within the first three weeks of, of the breeding <coughs> season. Um, in terms of identifying cows that have uh, uterine health issues, uh, this would not really, if, it's not going to, if you're not going to get someone in to do an ultrasound, then the next best thing is um, to metric check these animals. And that's something that you can do, do yourself needs to be done, you know, at least a month before mating start date, um, you know, because it's a good time point. It has given a lot of cows time to recover from any uterine health issues that they, they've had, but it also is allowing enough time for these animals to be identified um, and treated okay, and giving the, the, the treatment enough time to take effect by, by mating start date. You know, then, you know, I suppose another important aspect of breeding management uh, once breeding has started is, you know, good uh, record keeping to identify, um, you know, the, the, the cows that aren't yet uh, submitted. So, you know, whether it's through the, the handheld or whether you're doing it manually, all of this data should be going up to the ICBF and you need to be, it'd be a very good idea to be running uh, weekly fertility reports to see um, are you on target. So by target, I guess if we're, talk, we're talking about having 30% submitted by the first week of calving, 60% submitted by the second week of breeding, sorry, and 90% uh, uh, submitted by the, the third week of breeding, okay? And, you know, if you're not making these targets, you know, you identify the, the, the animals that haven't been bred and, you know, definitely get them checked out and see do they, are they not cycling or do they have a uterine health issue? Okay, but it, it, there's just, you need to be proactive at kind of at, at during that time. So, you know, in every herd, there are going to be some problem cows. And these are the cows that have had calving issues early in the spring, difficult calving um, for, for being the main one, over 10 placenta. And there'll be cows which have had health issues like uh, milk fever, uh, ketosis, LDAs, and there, you know, obviously there's going to be some cows maybe still with a low fertility subindex and also these late carvers. These are in particular are the animals that need special attention and um, to be, you know, get examined before, before breeding um, to see what, if, they, if they do need some, some intervention to, to get them going. So I mentioned about the metric checking. So I'm going to go and uh, describe kind of what's involved in terms of identifying cows with um, basically dirty cows with, with uh, uterine discharge. So like the, the metric check device, I guess, is a, it's a steel bar with a, a rubber scoop that can collect the, the contents of the vagina and that can be scored. 
Um, you know, when you're going through this, you know, hygiene is obviously very important. You don't want to be introducing any dirt into the vagina. So it's a good idea to have at least two buckets of water with a disinfectant, something like Savlin or, or vet scrub, chlorhexidine, uh, one for washing down the cow and one for washing the, the metric check device uh, between each cow. So it's placed in the, the vagina, you collect the mucus and you score it, okay? So I'll go through then the, the scoring system. So there, there's five grades to the scoring system, okay? As you can see in the pictures here. Um, a score one is clear mu mucus with no pus. And this should be the majority of their herd. And these are the cows that are, have successfully undergone uterine involution and um, are ready for breeding. Going on from that, then there's going to be a cows with a score two, which is more or less clear mucus with some flex of pus. Then a score three is mucus with less than 50% pus. Um, score four is mucus with greater than 50% pus. And a score five is greater than 50% pus and, and a foul smell. So basically from what we have done, we would be recommending that cows with a score for two or greater um, at about a month, uh, before mating start date, should uh, they, they they have still they still have a uterine infection and they're going to need um, intrauterine antibiotic to to clear that infection. Okay. So moving on, I guess to um, dealing with the non-cycling cows. Okay. So the the best option for non-cycling cows is a timed AI protocol. Okay. And the advantage of a timed AI protocol is, is that it's going to promote cyclicity in cows that have not yet started cycling. Um, the candidates to get the best response from this are going to be cows that are at least 30 days in milk, okay? So that would mean that it's a 10 day protocol so that they will be at least 40 days in milk uh, when they get inseminated. Um, just a point to note if I, in case I don't come back to it later, but if you are setting up cows for, for sex semen, um, we would recommend that they are at least 40 days in milk um, when they start the protocol so that they are at least 50 days in milk uh, when they actually get inseminated. So as I mentioned, it's, it's a 10 day protocol. Um, so you should start 10 days before mating start date. And it begins with the insertion of the progesterone device and an injection of GnRH. And the, tra the trade names for the different products are at the bottom of the screen, okay? But the progesterone device uh, is going to needs to remain in the cow for eight days. So it's going to be removed two days before mating start date. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is that the progesterone device is removed at this stage. Because if it's not removed and it's still in the cow, she is not going to come into heat, she's not going to ovulate, and the whole protocol has been a waste of time. But it's, it's, it's basically the most important part of the protocol that this progesterone device is removed. So the next step in the protocol involves two injections of prostaglandin. This needs to be done uh, three days before mating start date and two days before mating st start date. And the reason for this is to make sure that the crop luteum regresses um, so that the cow will be able to come into heat and ovulate, okay? The next step then is the day, the evening, sorry, the evening before um, mating start date. Um, so 32 hours after the, the progesterone devices are removed, the cows need to get a, another injection of GnRH, okay? And this is to make sure that they, they ovulate the follicle, okay? And then AI is going to be uh, the following morning, so uh, around the, from basically there's a window the next morning between 9 a.m. and and 1 p.m. Um, where the cows need to be 100% of them inseminated. So with this uh, protocol, look, there are five interventions. The cow the cow needs to be handled five times. It involves four injections and one progesterone device. And the way this protocol is set up is that there shouldn't be any cows in heat um, the day before the, the evening before mating started. But if some do come in, that is okay. 
still give the GnRH product and inseminate the following morning. Um, I want to discuss a bit now about heat detection and, and when cows come, come into heat and the importance of um, you know, uh, heat detection um, once breeding starts. So, so, you know, we've done quite a bit of work monitoring uh, estrus behavior at, in cows and, and when, they, when they come into heat. And this is just a graph uh, from a study that we did in Park a number of years ago, showing the timing basically throughout the day of when uh, cows start to come into heat. And basically, it looks at the x-axis is the hours of the day and the y-axis the y is the proportion in the herd. But more or less, there's cows coming, going to start coming into heat throughout the day, okay? But the majority of the animals actually uh, do come into heat overnight, okay? You, you probably notice yourself from doing your, your own observations. So some other uh, information that we got from this study is that on average, uh, a cow is going to be, is, will be in heat for eight hours. However, over half, over half the herd are actually in heat for less than eight hours, okay? And this kind of brings up the point of why we've always been recommending at least three periods of heat detection uh, throughout the day, um, because without them, it, there is a good chance that you, you, will, you will miss some of the cows that are coming into heat. So we're recommending three periods of heat detection throughout the day, and obviously with a heat detection aid uh, such as a tail paint. No, another um, finding that we uh, discovered from this study was that late calving cows, so the cows that are calving in April, um, they, when, when they do come into heat during the breeding season, they have shorter heats compared with the cows that, were, that calved in, in February and March. So we, we already know that late calving cows are at a disadvantage um, from a fertility point of view, but they are also, um, they show weaker heats and are, are, can be more uh, difficult to det detect in heat. Um, so we kind of often get asked about all of these, these interventions that we're talking about, you know, the once a day milking, the, you know, um, the need for, for synchronization, etc. And about these interventions, but probably the greatest intervention that um, you can have in your herd is to select a team of bulls with a high fertility sub-index. And we've done a lot of work comparing high and low fertility sub-index cows here in Moorpark. And the main findings from these studies have shown that cows with a high fertility sub-index, they have greater body condition score throughout lactation. They have less uh, endometritis, so less uterine health issues. They start cycling quicker. When they're in heat, they show stronger heats. And when they're bred, they're more fertile, okay? So, you know, just highlighting, you know, the real impact, the positive impact that a, a team of high fertility sub-index bulls can have on, on, on your herd. Um, move, moving on, I guess, now to um, the heifer synchronization work. We might and take a couple of questions, Stephen, if sure. you don't mind. Yeah, that's fine. Um, there's a few questions coming in there. And as I say, folks, please do post them, post them in the chat box below. Um, just on that, a question from Roy. Do you recommend pre-scanning cows, Stephen? Um, you did mention it in your study, or is that a recommendation? Um, yeah. What's uh, your feelings on that? Yeah, I, I mean, during the, the pre-breeding anyway, I mean, you've got a couple of options, but, you know, in terms of identifying problem cows like the non-cyclers or the cows that, say, a uter that have uterine infections, either metric checking or doing a, a pre-breeding ultrasound like would, be, would definitely be recommended to identify these animals. There's probably around, you know, there's going to be about 20% 20, 20 of the herd will have a uterine infection uh, still, um, you know, three to four weeks before mating start date. And at that stage, you know, they're not going to, to, to clear the infection themselves and they need to be identified and get, get treated. And, you know, the cows that are not cycling, particularly the February calves that are not cycling still from, you know, the first week of April, they, they're going to need some help to, to, um, to make sure that they are submitted uh, during the first three weeks of the breeding season. 
So, yeah. Is it fair to say, Stephen, I suppose, looking at that slide there, that we're actually on, I suppose, um, pre-breed scanning um, probably will differ for herds depending on where, where, where the levels of fertility are at within those individual herds? Yeah, I mean, for sure, look, herds with a, that have a higher fertility subindex will have um, less cows uh, with problems, okay? Yeah. Um, but within every herd, there are still cows with a low fertility subindex, okay? okay? And we know that even with the gains that we've made with the fertility subindex and the EBI in recent years, there are still um, problem cows in every herd, okay? So for sure, we're, we're making improvements, but but I, I don't think any herds can be um, complacent that about the them not having um, mm -hmm. some problem cows. Okay. Um, another question in there, Stephen. Um, you mentioned the negative implications of difficult calf and obviously retained cleanings, ketosis on fertility, which is understandable. Um, just will you comment? on how much of an effect I suppose that mastitis has on cow fertility and conception rates as well or um yeah um so so so, so mastitis because it's an it's an inflammatory disease um you know it does definitely have a, an impact on on um on, on fertility um so yeah yeah it, it does partic particularly particularly when the mastitis occurs before breeding. So in early lactation and before breeding and during breeding. The mastitis that occurs, you know, after the breeding season will obviously have less of an impact on, on, on the fertility rates. But, but mastitis before, before breeding um, will, will reduce pregnancy rates. Okay. Um, one final question there. What is the conception rates to, to, to these protocols, I suppose, and, and ultimately what's the advantages or, or, or what's that going to do in terms of our final pregnancy rate, Stephen? Okay. Um, so so from, from a lot of work that we have done where we have, you know, from studies, we've gone in and synchronized entire herds. Um, the conception rates between animals that are that are synchronized or bred off, off of observed teats, our pregnancy rates will be the same. However, that's, that, those are research studies. In reality, you're not going to be synchronizing the entire herd. You're going to be synchronizing the problem cows, the cows that are not cycling and the cows that have, you know, that are thin or have, a, have a uterine infection. And so already you've identified a poor population of your cows, okay? So whether you synchronize them or not, you can't expect that their conception rates are going to be fantastic. The advantage of synchronizing them is that you make sure that they get submitted on time and you're giving them every chance. Even if they don't go in heat, or sorry, even if they don't become pregnant for that first insemination, they will come around quickly three weeks later and they will still, you'll get, still have a second chance to get them uh, inseminated within the first three weeks. Okay. Um, there was, a, was there another part of that, James? No. Nope. Right. Maybe that's perfect. Yeah. Um, George, maybe for one, one for you, we'll, we'll, we'll not leave you out in the cold. Um, can you give advice on timing of AI uh, when the AI tech is coming once a day? Uh, if the cow is showing heat in the morning, is it too early to AI straight away? Um, or does, should, should the person wait, we'll say, 24 hours on AI the next day? People are surprised at the interval that occurs between the start of standing heat and ovulation. On average, it's 30 hours. So if a cow has just started to come in heat, uh, she won't ovulate. That's 8 in the morning. She won't ovulate for 30 hours or thereabouts. But it would be 2 or 3 in the afternoon of the following day. If, she, if you're unsure of when she was bullying and she's standing hard in the morning, it's safe enough to inseminate her that morning with conventional semen. And is it, is it because the conventional semen will last, will survive in the uterus for a good period of time before it will be lost. But if she's only just on, there's no rush to inseminate her that day. You might, you would wait if she's only just barely coming on. You'd nearly wait till the following morning. She still won't have ovulated by the following morning. And there's a good chance she conceives at the following morning's insemination. 
Okay, perfect. It's quite different to the sex semen. We'll come back to that later on, maybe, James. Yeah, there's a question in there on sex semen. Now, there is a session on that Thursday, but if we do have time, we, we'll come back to that later on. Yeah. Final question, Stephen, before I let you proceed. Um, I suppose, look, at, there's a question in there on, on um, the why weight program as such, or, or these cows that are um, that have been a bull in the week prior to breeding. Um, is there any research done on that, or um, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, so we we haven't done any work with, with these white weight programs, and maybe just to, to explain them for anyone that's not familiar with them, generally it involves beginning a pre-breeding heat detection uh, two weeks before mating start date. And at, for the, the cows that come into heat 14 to 17 days before mating start date, tail painting them a blue, for example, okay? And then the cows that come into heat in the, the, the week immediate before breeding, painting them uh, another color. And then the, the cows that, have, that were in heat two weeks previous, Sorry, they can be. They get a shot of prostaglandin two two days before mating start date, so that they will be in heat at mating start date. And the reason for that is that we've known when they have last been in heat, and we can give that injection of prostaglandin. We we know that they they have a seal. There'll be another one third of cows then that will come into heat during the first week of the breeding season, and then there will be the cows that were in heat um, the week before uh, breeding. Uh, they will get an injection of prostaglandin um, on day five of the of mating uh, day five of the breeding season, and they should come into heat. So it is an option for for bringing cows into a large number of cows into heat during uh, the first week of the breeding season. I suppose you know because it is based on a pros using prostaglandin. It will only work in cows that are cycling. There will still be cows that in your herd. Um, at around this time that haven't begun cycling yet and um, they are not going to respond to the um, to that program and you, you so, so you're going to end up either waiting them for them to come into heat or you're going to synchronize them eventually so you're the, correct Stephen. In, in terms with, of those cows you spoke about um those problem cows i suppose a program like that isn't going to isn't going to submit those cows for you in, in, it, in it's not and, and you know there, even if a cow is cycling, sorry, I suppose it's, I should say that there, there are, there is likely to be a small proportion of cows that will be will be cycling, and they should respond to the prostaglandin, and they probably will respond to the prostaglandin, Ooh. but they still don't come into heat, and th that that can be an issue as well, or or else you don't see them when they're in heat. Okay, so so you know I guess one one issue okay for. Those programs can deal with a large number of cows, but, but you're not guaranteeing, guaranteeing submission rate. Okay. Um, George, one question there for you, and we'll move on to the heifer programs. Um, 180 cow dairy herd. Uh, they have about 120 cows calved up to date. Yeah. Um, are they going to run into trouble with the bre breeding period? And I suppose... Uh, have you any advice with maybe, is there anything we can do with those late calving cows? We spoke about um, maybe cows that are under-conditioned. Um, is there anything that this man can do with his late calving cows to uh, Im says, improve his submission rates? Yeah, James, I think he says he is going to run into trouble during the breeding period. Not is he? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. He, I think what, um, look, we, we defer to Stephen for the protocols on hormonal intervention. Uh, there's 120 cows calved there. The aim is to get those uh, bred in the first three weeks of the breeding season. So it's preheat checks on those cows. Um, it'll be recording and intervening with the ones that aren't seed breeding. Then I divide up the remaining 60 cows, assuming he wants to breed them, into two groups. And the group that are, there's going to be now another 60 to calf between the middle of March and probably the end of April. I break them into two groups and, and of uh, 30 or thereabouts and do two reproductive inter intervention treatments on them in groups of 30, uh, one about three weeks in, and then the remaining group uh, three weeks after that. So you're going to have a lower than optimal submission rate, but at least you're intervening to bring the cows forward, get them cycling, and improve their chances of remaining in the herd next year. I suppose on top of that, George, is, is there, should, 
Is there any benefit with putting these late calving cows on once a day, um, right away, we'll say, from, from the onset of calving? In, in any of the research that's being done, that I've seen done, uh, refers back to New Zealand quite a long time ago. And they're, they're getting similar performance to uh, putting cows on once a day, particularly if, if uh, condition is an issue. Conditions grow, those cows is an issue. They're seeing um, uh, similar performance levels compared to a cedar program at the start of the breeding season. So with the thinner cows, absolutely, it's the route you'd, you'd consider going down as well. And maybe you'd have a, it, would, it will have an impact on the quantity of hormonal treatment required during the breeding season as a result. Okay. Look at the questions are flying in there. I'm just yeah. conscious of time. So we'll, we'll, we'll let you um, continue on, Stephen. And if we have time at the end, we, we'll answer as many of them as possible. Okay, James. Uh, so I just have a couple of slides on, on breeding heifers, a couple of synchronization um, programs. So, so obviously, you know, your heifers in the herd, they're, they're the highest EBI. They're the, the prime candidates for generating uh, high EBI uh, dairy replacements from. And um, they, sh they should be it's, it's inseminated um, as soon as possible um, and the early, as, as early as possible in, in, uh, during the breeding season. So to begin with, the simplest protocol is the, the prostaglandin, it involves the prostaglandin protocol. It's the cheapest and the simplest. The one caveat being that these, that heifers must be cycling. So if you have any heifers that are not cycling, the prostaglandin protocol is not going to work. So, and obviously you're going to have to do heat detection with them as well. So basically on, day, on, the, on the, the, the slide there you see day zero. So day zero is mating start date. And for the first week of, of breeding, you're going to do a regular um, heat observations and breed the, breed the cows off of heat, off of heats for the first week. And then on day seven, any of the heifers that were not inseminated during the, the first week of the breeding season, each of those gets one shot of, of prostaglandin. They should come into heat within the next two to five days and be inseminated. There's probably potentially, you know, maybe somewhere around five to 10% of the heifers that are not going to get uh, to, to respond to that first injection of prostaglandin. And those heifers uh, should be, in some, they need to get another uh, injection of prostaglandin 11 days um, after the first injection. And they, they should come into heat, but, but if they do not come into heat, they need to get time the eye 72 hours and 96 hours after the, that second shot of prostaglandin, okay? Uh, to, so it, the reason being that because you don't have a good idea of when they're in heat, um, just make sure that they, they, that they get inseminated regardless. <clears throat> And with, the, with, with this type of protocol, 90% um, of the heifers are going to get inseminated within the first uh, 10, 10 days of the breeding season, okay? So a very good option for, for, for cheap and simple and for, for heifers that are cycling. Then the, I guess the, 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 the next step up from that then to deal with is it going to be a timed AI protocol for heifers um, similar to cows, but it's a bit shorter than the pro program I outlined for the cows. Um, so it's a timely eye protocol. It will be suitable in heifers that are cycling and are not cycling. Um, it's a timely eye, as it said, and heifers can be inseminated regardless of whether they show heat or not. Um, it's an eight-day protocol, so it needs to begin eight days before mating start date. It begins with the progesterone device and the injection of the GnRH product. And then um, three days and two days before mating start date, again, the heifers need to get um, an injection of prostaglandin um, to regress the corpus luteum so that the cows will come into heat. And as I outlined earlier, please make sure that you remove the, the progesterone device. With this protocol then, um, the heifers uh, should be in heat uh, the evening before or, or the night of and the, that morning uh, of day zero and they need to be get inseminated 48 hours um, after the removal of the, the progesterone device. And again, they should get an injection of GnRH. The difference between this protocol and the protocol for the cows is that with the heifers, the in final GnRH is being given when they are being inseminated, whereas with the cows, they got that final GnRH 
the evening before they're going to be inseminated. Um, I suppose just a couple of comments on synchronizing groups of heifers like this. And, you know, if you are dealing with a large group of heifers, some planning is going to be involved with the AI technician. Um, you know, give them a heads up that, that this is your plan. Um, and maybe arrange a time for a quieter part of the day that the, um, the heifers can be inseminated when, when the technician has finished with the, the cows. So, for example, if we're going to do something like that, and let's say we want the, the technician to arrive at uh, 2 p.m. in the afternoon, that would mean that, that uh, pr the, the prids should be removed at 2 p.m. two days previous. Okay? So just, just, just a point on that, but it does offer some flexibility. So I think I think that's where I finish up. Uh, yeah. Just a question on that, Stephen. In terms of um, conception rates, I suppose that in terms of trial work that's been completed at that, or what, what conception rates can be can be expected with those programs? Um, with heifers, um, you're you're going to be expecting uh, pregnancy rates of seventy percent. Okay, that's regardless of whether they are synchronized or whether they're bred off of a, a natural heat. And th th I should say that's with conventional semen. If you're using sex semen, um, you're going to take probably a 10% hit. So you're talking about um, um, a 6% conception rate in heifers uh, with sex semen. Probably uh, one kind of you know decision rule that you can make around the use of sex semen with heifers would be that um, in the heifers that do show heat, prioritize them for sex semen. And the other heifers, because it's, because some heifers won't show heat, um, give them the the conventional straw. Okay. So to mitigate risk, Stephen, I suppose that's that that that's a good recommendation to follow. Yeah, and I, I think you're prioritising the the, the the you're getting trying to get the best use out of those sex semen straws. Just a question in there, um, Stephen, for yourself. Why is there need for two shots of PG in the, in that particular program there? So with this protocol, um, because the, the first shot of GNRH is given when at the start of that protocol, that um, induces the, will ovulate a new follicle and uh, create a new CL. Um, the, and that, it's to make sure that that CL gets, um, gets regressed, um, um, okay? That, that is the reason, okay? Because if that CL does not regress, um, the, cow won't, the, cow, the, the cow or the heifer uh, won't come into heat. Okay, so the double shot is to, is to ensure that. Yes, yeah, and there's been quite a bit of work done on, on, on the efficacy of it, and there is an advantage to using two, two um, injections of prostaglandin as opposed to, as opposed to one. Okay. Um, I'm conscious that we're, we're, we're leaving Willie um, out there and I'm, I'm sure he's chomping at the bit to get involved. So what we'll do is there's a few questions coming in there, but we'll, we'll hold them. Um, we're going to I'll get you maybe to stop sharing, Stephen, right. and we'll have a chat with, your, with yourself, Willie. As I say, Willie's a, a, a dairy farmer from Farn 4, um, County Kerry. So I, I suppose, William, give us a... A little bit of background about yourself, your herd, um, just to the audience. Okay, no problem. It's um, it's a, a mainly a crossbred herd. Uh, there's over 100 cows, and um, we started calving the 6th of February, and uh, there's just over 80% calf now. And um, the the way I work it really is it's it all starts in, in the in, when I, when I scan in November, I usually scan in late October, early November, and I condition score them and, and I just monitor them from there till drying off. And when they're dried off, I would keep an eye on them again. Anything cows or anything, I would I would always uh, feed them while they're dry. So uh, I suppose in, in, in terms of implementing some of the practice that Stephen has spoke about, um, you spoke about body condition score, and I suppose, and, and when does pre-breeding start for you? You're, you're ultimately saying it starts with, with the dry cows, William. It starts with the dry cows. I'd be a great believer in having the cows in good condition, calving down in the right condition, and 
uh, as they can. If there if there was any cows that had twins or anything like, if the cows had twins or retained after, but I might put them in once a day for a few weeks. I might put them in once a day until the breeding season. I put them in once a day until I think that the condition of them was good enough, and I would. Um, that's the way I would work it. But the pre-breeding, the pre-breeding would start three weeks before the, the AI season would start. So just on the one today, it, it, it is a practice that you. Um, it's a practice that you're using, yeah. and you stated that to us earlier. So, um, in terms of the number of cows, I suppose that you'd have to put uh, put on once a day. Um, what kind of percentage or what number of cows? The, in the hundred cows, maybe five to seven would be the most I ever had. Okay. But maybe the April calvers, you were talking about the April calvers there earlier on. Mm. I would usually put the few April calvers on once a day, take off the pressure and let them go straight to AI and then bring them back to twice a day. Okay. And obviously you, you've, you've over 80% calved in five weeks, so you're on target to do, as George spoke about, the 90% calved. Just in terms of um, your heifers, how many heifers, I suppose, have you calved, or how many have you left? I have 20 out of 22 calved. Okay. 20 out of 22. Yeah. Okay, very good. And when's your plans um, start a breeding, um, William? 6th of May. Okay. 6th of May, I start. So I'll, I, I'll, three weeks back from that, I'll be, three weeks back from that, even, even further, maybe. 15th, 15th, uh, 12th, 10th, 12th of April, I will start recording all the, all the heats. And okay. any comments that are not seen cycling, before I ever start, I will uh, get the vet to check them out. Okay. okay. So and in terms of heat detection? Um, heat, scratch what? cards and tail paint. Okay, scratch Loathers. cards and tail paint. Yeah, lots of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're a fan of the scratch cards, something you were saying to us earlier? Yeah, the scratch card has worked very well for me. I'd be a big fan of the scratch card. And just lay, when you put on the glue, just make sure it gets tacky and then put on the cards. And it has worked very well. And um, I, I, I continue to use it. Is William. that just to give extra security, William, around the, um, I yeah, suppose? They're, they're very effective. Okay. They're very effective. Yeah. And in terms of, I suppose, last season, um, William, you said in terms of, okay, you identify these problem cows um, and your vet comes in and, and, and scans them. I suppose, what, how many had you last year? What had you to do with them? And sure, sure. What was, was the success five, rate, I suppose? There was five or six of them all together. And we put prids or coils into them. And uh, the rest of them, were, we, we only gave them PG. And in actual fact, uh, it was the best ever... They all went in calf bar one. I checked it there, there today and now. I think it was one that just didn't, that slipped. Okay. okay. Very good. You actually spoke as well about, in terms of the percentage of heifers that you've held, held in the herd um, after first lactation. Um, I think you held all your heifers last I year, have, first lactation animals. So. Last, year I lost, I, I, last year I lost one. This year I held them all. And I think that's all down to, I think body condition score is so important. It's the it's the it's the hub of this thing because if you if the cows aren't in the right condition, body condition calving, if they're in the right body condition at AI, you're 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 on the back foot really. Okay. By experience anyway. I suppose then getting into the program, how long do you how long do you actually AI for or do you AI for the full period or I uh, AI for seven weeks for, for replacements. And the last three weeks, I bring in the dark bull, but I would still use AI with it. I, I, I have two Angus bulls, and I run the Angus bulls, and I use AI as well. Okay, so you're AI and along with the bulls for yeah, extra security. Uh, we, we, want, we, want, we, we want to take any chances anyway. The most important thing is get as many cows in calf as possible. Okay. And in terms of then, I suppose, so do you select the cows that get dairy AI or is it blanket dairy AI across the herd in the, in the first if five the, or six weeks? Any, on the, any cows that are on the performing herd that I wouldn't be happy with their uh, percentage brought in or anything, I, I w or if there, was, if there was a cell count issue or anything, I would only put Angus in them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
And then in terms of your heifers, look, you said you've 20 out of 22 um, calf to date. Maybe fill us in on the procedure with those, Willie. The heifers, I brought in the heifers last autumn, the, the last year's, uh, the, the spring, the 2020 bottom calves, and uh, I brought them in in early November and I weighed them. And there was 11 of them, 15 kilos under the average weight. And I, 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 um, I taped their tails, I suppose it was madness, but I fed them an extra kilo twice a day for 90 days. And actually that group, are, they're gone out to the contract rarer now and they're gone out at 305 kilos. So I think um, it was well worth, well worth doing now. So I suppose, yeah, you're, you're, you're 50 odd days probably there since they left to yeah. mate and start date and, and you're, up at that, you're up at that weight already. In terms of the protocol then, um, what have you been doing with your heifers? Um, are, they, are they getting AI? Um, They're AI for 20 days and then the stock bull and AI with it. Okay. So your AI into natural heats or have been AI into natural heats? Natural for, heats, for, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you, um, you, you pointed out earlier that you may, you're thinking about um, changing to one of the programs that Stephen spoke to. One of the programs there that Stephen spoke about, I'd probably go for the, I, I'd probably AI for seven days and then PG him. And just to see how that will work. But again, using the tail paint and the scratch cards as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. Very good. And having all vaccinations done early and all that done properly for them as well. I'd be doing, there'd be extra vaccinations. The fact that I go with the contract rare, but all that's done. I, I, I that done before, never doubt. Okay. Clip their tails, clip their back, have it all ready for the scratch cards and have it ready for the tail paint as well. Very good. Very good. Excellent. So we've, I think we've, we've, we've 10 or 12 questions coming in here. We might get stuck into them um, for the three guys. If you just unmute yourselves there. Um, James, I'd ask, I'd ask Willie the question. If he had a third of his cow still to calf, what would he do? I, 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 out, I was looking at that, that yeah. question there that came in. Yeah. And he is 66% of his calves. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Right. And um, once a day it comes straight away, but there's a, huge, there's a huge number of cows. But I still think it worked though. I still think he'd get good, he'd get good results out of the once a day. You know, he, the once I a said, day, you're, you're taking off pressure straight away. You're taking the pressure off and it's giving him every chance. That's the way I'd look at it. In terms of that, George, is there cost analysis done on that in terms of the cost of the once a day versus the, the added benefits to those late calving cows? Yeah, so the, the cost of the once a day will depend on the duration of the cow on once a day. So typically she'll breed after 40 days, between 30 and 40 days on once a day. And some, William, you said you actually go back to twice a day once she's bred. Yeah. Except since Stuart have had this debate, Stuart Childs, a colleague of ours. And yes. We said we'd hold them for the three weeks until we were sure she was in calf. <laughs> what How I would do you feel do about is that? Usually three, maybe five days after the yeah, anchor. Let would. her back. Let her back Let off her and back. twice a day. Yeah. Work fine. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Work very well. So the cost would be less than James. Probably work out around thirty euro a cow in terms of last milk. But, okay. uh, but there's an argument too. If uh, when you do go once a day, obviously the, you, your constituents will probably improve as well. The will, yeah, but that's, that's adjusted for that, that thing. I, mean, I know what you mean, it is, yeah. It's, it was always 30% less milk over a whole year, William, and 25% yeah, less yeah. solids. Yeah. yeah. Black and white herds, yeah. Probably one thing to point to George's too, just um, knowing the somatic cell count of those cows as well to make sure they are suitable for, um, once, a day. for once a day. A that's few good. questions coming in there. Um, what kind of cost, I suppose, Stephen, on... Um, the PG injections or, or, or that simple heifer program, I suppose. Willie has said that he's going to implement that this year to tighten them up a little bit. What's the cost to the farmer if they want to go with that simple PG program? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's a few euro per shot. That's, that's, that's about it, yeah. And in terms, of the fixed, um, in terms of the fixed time AI program then for the heifers, cost associated with that? 
yeah, with, with the time DI, you obviously there's a bit more involved. So <clears throat> you're probably talking about 30 to 35 euro. Um, I think it really does depend on the number of heifers that you're going to do with it. And I mean, if you're doing a larger number of heifers, then they're probably, it can be gotten a bit cheaper. But you're, ta- you're 30 to 35 euro. For, um, okay. In- interestingly, James, I had um, a query from an advisor a couple of days ago and we spoke to Stephen Butler about it. Sorry, Stephen, we over went over you. And um, it was about his, he was finding it hard to pick up heifers in heat. And he was considering both the use of fixed time AI and sex semen in the maiden heifers. As a, and Stephen Butler was kind of on, was recommending that pro, uh, program to give better control of uh, the timing of ovulation and insemination with the sex sex semen. So it was a combination of the two he was going to use in the coming season to overcome his issue with picking up heifers bullying. Very good. Um, Willie, a question in there. Are you running the once a day cows in a separate herd or do you run them with the main pack and just not milk them? I run them with the main pack, but I tape, I tape their tails. I'm mad for taping. I tape their tails. I put orange tape in their tails and that's it. Okay, so you identify them, you just clearly identify them yeah, really. I clearly identify them. Yeah. I suppose an important point with that is that when the animals are put on once a day, that there is, they receive the, the same level of feed. Um, oh, yeah, I feed them the same. I do everything the same, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, Stephen, um, will most of the two and to a lesser extent three Metricheck scores not self cure by mate and start date? if diagnosed in late March? Yes. So, so, um, so in terms of it too, we're talking about where there's, there's um, still uh, flexipus or, and then a score three where it's less, less than 50% pus. And, and it's a fair point. I, I think because they may do, some of them certainly may do, but we do know like there is a good bit of research on giving Metricure to to these types of cows, and we do know that when they do get it, they do have better uh, conception rates. Okay. Willie Will said, "Yeah, Willie said that he uses both uh, scratch cards and tail paint." William, do you remember that? Yeah, correct. Why, Garot Satter here is asking, "Why is it worth going for the two forms? Yeah. Why wouldn't you just go with the scratch cards if you're so fond of them?" Listen, come here. All I want is cows in the parlour in, in, in the first six weeks, and I will do anything to do that. Like, come on, come on. <laughs> Bells and braces, so James. Um, another question for you, Willie. Does Willie use a vasectomized bull? No, no. Don't use them. Okay. No. Um, a question, another question for Willie. You're popular tonight. Um, does Willie put a lot of emphasis on the fertility sub-index um, in terms of bull selection? Um, I put a good bit of work into the picking the bulls and uh, uh, the fertility the fertility sub-index, I would be watching it. I, 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 I would. I would, yeah. I suppose, yeah. I'd put a good bit of time into it, yeah. Okay. Stephen, heifers that get fixed time AI, do they need inve- intervention the following year? I suppose the question there is, has it any impact on their, on their subsequent um, fertility? Uh, no, no, James, it doesn't. And, you know, the, particularly the bigger issue with, with heifers really is if they don't get, if they calve down later as first lactation cows and they've less time to um, recover before their, their second breeding season, then they're more likely to actually need some intervention. But from the point of view of, you know, that synchronizing heifers might lead to keeping poor fertile and heifers in or and them being more likely to need intervention next year's is, is it's, it's not the case. Okay. Um, there's a couple coming in there in sex semen. So we, we, we might just, um, I suppose I'll ask them, but there is a half an hour of a webinar. We will take one of them now. There's a half an hour of a webinar on Thursday night or one half of a webinar um, that is covering sex semen. So, but for you, Stephen, do, do any of the synchronization programs have an effect, good or bad, on conception rates of sex semen? 
Well, the, the, in fact, we, we, you know, desynchronization protocols, they're not going to have any negative effect on, on conception rate. Um, the main reason that, that synchronization protocols are used is because you control your submission rate. But they're, when, when they're implemented correctly, there, there are no negative effects on, on conception rate. Um, I mentioned about, you know, so, so when you do use these protocols, I mentioned that there won't, there won't be some cows, some cows won't show heat. And I think that when, when selecting animal cows for, for sex semen, it will, it will be best, so the cows that do show heat, prioritize them for, for sex semen. Okay. I think, in fact, Stephen Butler, Stephen, Stephen Butler actually uh, liked, favoured the use of the synchronisation with the CEDAR program because it gave him a good handle on the timing of ovulation. So in fact, he was maybe even seeing uh, enhanced conception rate to sex semen. Probably mitigating risk as, as, as well, um, George, in the fact that all animals are bred, you know, bred day one. Um, so exactly. if conception rates are yeah. somewhat slower uh, or, or lower, I should say, um, you'd be picking up AI your repeats three weeks later. So you exactly. still have a high percentage of heifers calving down in that, in that first three week period. Exactly. Um, take another, um, we'll take another couple of questions um, and we're going to wrap up then. Um, I kind of a double question, uh, one for you, Willie, and, and one for you, George. Um, how many bulls um, does William use across the herd? Um, so how many, how many bulls will be in your AI team? Twelve. Okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. So you have 100 cows and, and, and 20 odd heifers and, and 12 bulls there. Yeah. George, to follow up with you, is there selection criteria, I suppose? Um, is there selection criteria there that people should be looking for within, within their bull team this year or, or what criteria, I suppose, have, um, yeah, so, have you set? Yeah, so when we look at kind of team averages and we're talking about maybe in black and white herds, first of all, we'd be talking uh, of maybe targeting a team average of 270 EBI with about 120 of it coming from fertilities of index. Now, if you want to stick to the, to the G2 or G3 bulls on the active bull list, we're, we're talking about more probably have to go at a slightly lower fertility sub index but you can with you can you can target teams of black and white bulls with with fertility sub index of maybe up to 120 for fertility sub index and to me the fertility sub index is the key driver of longevity in herds the key driver of cows remaining in the herd and keeping them calving early and compacting the breeding season you can go with a slightly lower team average if you're using crossbred bulls in the herd because willie's um Willie's herd is a crossbred herd, and um, he's achieving with slightly lower uh, fertility sub index than that. Okay. Um, just on that, George, I suppose there's, there's a question in there on G1 mm. bulls. So these young bulls coming through, worth going for George or not? So just maybe comment ar ar around that, George. The G1 yeah, bulls. Yeah, worth going for in packs. Um, individual using one individual bull and expecting big things from them is not the way to go. So this video is released today talking about maybe bull teams and look, we have targets there of seven or eight bulls for around a hundred cows and heifers uh, used uh, in equal quantities uh, and used evenly uh, through the herd. So if you whatever the the bulls you go for to ensure there isn't. Um, to, in, to ensure that the, you minimize the risk, it's, it's spread the risk by using even teams of bulls. William there said he's using a dozen bulls across 120 cows or thereabouts, 120 cows and heifers. That's the kind of numbers we're talking about. Spread the risk, go for EBI and use teams evenly. Okay, very good. Um... Amir, <clears throat> I think that's a pretty good place. We've, we've run five or six minutes over. Um... I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll ask um, each speaker one last question. And, and Stephen, from, from, from your piece, I suppose we've seen the national figures. Um, if there's one thing you want the listeners to, to take away from tonight um, to improve and, and ensure of a successful breeding season, what would that be? Yeah, well, look, I, I think the, the best thing that can be done now is to, to identify th those problem cows and, and put a, some 
quite a bit of effort into identifying those non-cyclers and the, the cows with uterine infections um, because they are, they are going to have, um, they're not going to get submitted and they're going to have poor conception rate if nothing is done with them. And, y you know, it's, it's a smaller proportion of the herd, but they, it is worth uh, pursuing them and, and treating them to make sure that they, they, they give them the best chance possible of going a calf in, in the first three weeks. Okay, George. Um, Same question for yourself. Yeah, one of the one of the one of the things I'm starting to notice is um, maybe a slippage in the compactness of calving. And I think it's because a lot of the a lot of the expansion has taken place, so we're now looking at a more mature and stable herd. So it's again to focus on the uh, pre-breeding area. Just tail paint is enough. Record heats. Pick up the cows that aren't seen bullying, and bring them in for an, some sort of an exam at the start or just before breeding starts to try and tighten up those cows, pick up the problem cows early, it'll enhance uh, compactness and submission rate. Okay. And Willie, um, any words of wisdom for our viewers? I suppose the most important thing is the is, is keeping good records. You know, you, the, 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 little, the little ICBF notebook, I'm all the time putting in notes there about, you know, when cows calve and they calve twins when retained after births. If cows are dirty or anything like any any anything like that, I think it's all about record keeping. You have to keep all the records in real to go back. If there is a problem, you can go back and say, "Yeah, that was a problem." And I I think is two things is probably record keeping and the condition of the cow. I think it's I think they're the two, they're the two things. I suppose uh, my, my one there to add one, folks, is probably. Focus on focus on our heifers now for this breeding season as well. Um, I think it's well worthwhile listening to what Stephen and and George and, and Willie had to say in terms of making sure they calve down to dairy AI in a, in a compact manner. We really want to get our heifer calves coming off our highest gen genetic merit animals. So do focus in on 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 your maiden heifers this year as well. I suppose, look, at, we're going to leave it there. Um, I want to take the opportunity to thank our three excellent speakers tonight. Um, thanks to Willie, Stephen and George um, on their excellent presentations. And, and no doubt, hopefully, um, you'll be fit to implement that at farm level. And I suppose it'll ensure a successful breeding season over the coming months. Just a final word on, as I said, this is part of ICBF Chagas Breeding Week. Um, do engage, I suppose, there, there's going to be a number of videos um, being published, videos, podcasts, written articles this week. Keep an eye on the Chagas website, Chagas forward slash Breeding Week to find out more or our social media platforms. And on Thursday night, there's another webinar um, which will be hosted by Jack Kennedy. And the two topics up for discussion that night are daughter proven bulls versus, I suppose, genomic bulls or uh, sires, and the much talked about um, topic of sex semen. So do tune in Thursday night at seven o'clock. And thank you and good night, folks. <laughs>